give God some praise. Amen. You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Wow, wow. I'm tempted to sing that song again. A powerful song. Hallelujah. It is marvelous in our eyes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is marvelous in our eyes. What a wonderful thing you are doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes By your power and love you are moving And it's marvelous in our eyes Hallelujah, hallelujah It is marvelous in watch him do it but it is marvelous in our eyes God has been good to us because of him we wouldn't we wouldn't we wouldn't be here but because of him we're here some of us would have lost our minds if it hadn't been for the Lord some of us anxiety would have had the better of us depression would have taken us out different worries would have knocked us out but because of the goodness of our God we are still here. So hallelujah. It is marvelous. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, let encounter arena sing. Because of his mercies, we are not consumed. Father, teach us your word by your spirit. So that we may be able to apply it to our lives and impart it onto other faithful people. You get all the glory. You get all the honor. Father, you be enthroned in this place. Let no man take dominion. Let no man take the glory. But you alone. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Let the church say amen. Oh, let the church say amen. Today I want to share a quick word with you and the title of my message, if you need one, is when you hear the sound. When you hear the sound. A few weeks ago, there was a sports day in my son's school and I was one of the loudest parents on the pitch, screaming, everybody, anybody who's running, I'm screaming the names because I know a few of the children in his school. So I just asked the parents, what's the name, what's the name? They just give me a name and I'm just screaming. I was screaming so loud eventually when they asked, who's the loudest parent on the pitch? Everybody said, Jade is that. <laughs> and then it was after when all the noise had been going on that they stopped and they said, now it's going to be the parents race. For those of you that do not know, um, yeah, some of us still got it. Amen. <laughs> Kai Kobolt. Uh, uh, some of you don't know, but when, when they called the parents race, I was walking around, running around, jumping everywhere. And once they called for the parents race, everybody was looking for me because I was the loudest on the pitch. And then the first race came in, the run, the second race, I was given all sorts of excuses. And people were saying, oh, you're scared, you're that, that. Everybody was going on. And I thought, you know what, let's go show them something. So I put myself together. I said, no more excuses. I got onto the pitch. And I was standing there. Before the whistle could go, I made a false start. Because I was too anxious. Because I was too excited, because I wanted to show them. Then I went back into the line, and all that mattered to me was to hear that whistle. 
It didn't matter what I was doing before the whistle. But as soon as the whistle went, I knew it was time to go. I wasn't concerned about who's next to me, whose parent is next to me, who wanted to win so their child don't think they are weak, who wanted to lose, who was just in for the fun of it. For me, once the whistle went, it was business. Everybody, some people were there for the fun, but for me, it was serious business. I took it as World Cup. Listen, I took it like I was in the Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, whichever games is the highest. Take, listen, I took it on the highest, utmost importance. And I started dashing for the line. I was not concerned what's going on behind me. All I could hear was the chairs going on. Hey, hey, hey. I had one neighbor. All I could hear was Charlie, Charlie, because he calls me Charlie. Charlie. And I was just going with that pace. I wasn't going to stop for anybody. By the time I crossed the finish line, some people were halfway. There. I don't know how I did it. I don't know what came into me. But all I know is that at the finish line, I raised my hand and people were cheering. What I'm trying to bring across to you, apart from me winning and showing you that I've still got it, what I'm trying to bring across to you is that my shouting on the pitch did not matter. My running around on the pitch did not matter. The encouragement I was giving everybody else did not matter. But when the sound went out, all that matters was what I was going to do from the sound to the finish line. When the athlete is on there, all he's waiting for is the sound. When he hears the sound, what matters is everything that happens after the sound. He may have had a personal best, run the 100 meter race in 7 seconds or 6 seconds, but once the sound goes, what matters is the race after the sound. He may have had personal training. He may have had companions. He may have been doing it in the pack. He may have done it in the sea sand so that he can gain resistance. But all of that did not matter. All that matters was what happened after the whistle. I don't know if you can hear the sound. It always amazes me how God does it in Encounter Arena. But this morning, he gave us a sound. He gave me this message and this morning he gave us a sound. I can guarantee you half of, listen, 99.9% .9 of the time my wife does not know what the message is. She has no clue until she hears me telling them so they can put it on the stream. So for God to bring us a message about the sound and to give us a sound, it means it is not preparation time, it is action time. Oh. It is not time for rehearsal. He has already blown the whistle. It didn't matter whether I was ready or not. It didn't matter whether my friends were cheering or not. All that mattered was that the sound had gone out. And so you need to head for the finish line. I came to announce to somebody this morning. The sound has been released. And when you hear the sound, it is time to act. It is time to move. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel, the chapter number three. Daniel, the chapter number three. This morning, it is my prayer that the Spirit of God will move you, will grant you inspiration and insight, and give you strength for the journey ahead. Amen. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. And set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, 
zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music. You must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship him will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse number 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing fire. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God? will be able to rescue you from my hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, Certainly, your majesty. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, Come out here. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies. Nor was the hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched. And there were no smell. There was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's commands and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I decree 
that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Somebody say amen. It's a lengthy story, right? Did I read well? <laughs> I'm following this story and this story is reminding me of a place like this world that we live in. The Jews were there, the Babylonians were there, the believers were there, the unbelievers, they were all gathered together in one place and they had one king over them, King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan king and so he worshipped idols and his pride was 99.9999 percent. King Nebuchadnezzar in his day was almost like a god. In fact, he was a god. King Nebuchadnezzar said something and it is final. He puts his voice down and it is final. If you disobey the voice of King Nebuchadnezzar, you, you are done. And so in his pride, he set up an image of gold. And he said, everybody under my covering, everybody who is covered by my authority, everybody within my kingdom, leaders and their followers, when you hear the sound, I want you all to bow down to the image that I've created. Bow down to the image that I've created. You see, we live in a generation, we live in a time where there is a sound. But the issue is, what are you doing at the sound? A lot of us, when your job puts up a sound, you make a decision. Every Monday morning at 6 o'clock, your alarm gives you a sound. What you do after the sound is what you are bound to. It's the command that has been issued to you. Every time the daylight breaks out, is a sound that has been released and there is a command that goes with it now the issue is when the sound goes who do you listen to God has issued a sound from the day you became born again the day you said God I accept you Lord Jesus I accept you as my Lord and Savior a sound was released and a command was given that serve no other God apart from me Whenever your alarm goes off, that is King Nebuchadnezzar saying, I have a command for you. Now the question is, when you hear the sound, do you lose your faith? When you hear the sound, do you forget the command that has been given you? When you hear the sound, do you put God on the back burner and listen to King Nebuchadnezzar? Because Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego had just been promoted and from the place of promotion you know that this guy has enough power so they could have said you know what guys let's just bow our heads so that we don't offend this man after all he has the power but when the sound came and the king said everybody bow what amazes me is that it is not the other officials that came it is not the provincial officials, it is not the prefects, it is not the satraps, it is none of them that came to King Nebuchadnezzar, it was the astrologers. These are people who read the stars and they read the weather, read the elements and they can tell you what is happening. These are the kind of people who saw a star and saw that a savior had been born. A king had been born in Bethlehem. They look into the atmosphere, they look into the clouds and they can determine what is happening. It was not the officials that went to King Nebuchadnezzar, it was the astrologers. Which tells me that everything you do in life, it is not done in a way of excuse. And you can say that I just did, there is nothing that is just done. 
everything that you do is reflected in the realm of the spirit. If astrologers could look into the sky and see that everybody was bowing but there are three men who are not bowing. It tells me that every time your alarm goes off and the first thing you pick up is your phone and you don't pray. It is registered in the realm of the spirit that you have not prayed. Every time it is time to go to church but you decide I need to be in bed. In the realm of the spirit it can be seen that everybody who is a believer is heading to church but you are in bed. Some of you may not understand how this works but how can one boy, his name is Joseph, wake up and share a dream and he said in the dream I saw that the stars were bowing down and the moon and the sun were also bowing to me what he saw was cosmic entities but when we see his story we see it happen if an astrologer had seen that he would have told them this is what the future is somebody sitting under the sound of my voice you have a representation in the atmosphere you have a representation in the cloud and so when your star is covered your life is going nowhere until your star is revealed you are never revealed sometimes I wish somebody would catch this sometimes until your star is revealed no matter how hard you try you're not going anywhere so sometimes when you pray you've got to pray and say Lord let my star shine everybody has a representation in the realm of the spirit it took astrologers who were in the place that did not see three men standing because there is a sea of people it is going to be impossible to see three men standing no matter how far they are and if they were close enough then they didn't need to tell the book Nazar because the book Nazar would have seen him he would have seen the three boys but in the realm of the spirit these three guys were still standing so they came to the king they said king you issue the command but these three guys have refused to obey your command so the king like a father he calls the three boys guys come here I just promoted you guys I'm trying to help you guys can you not see all you have to do is to bow so I'll let them sound again just in case it was an error just because you because you didn't hear me say maybe let me tell you when the sound goes I want you to bow your heads the three boys said king we do not have to defend ourselves in this matter but from where we are coming from we have been told that we should bow not our heads to any other God apart from our God Yahweh we have been told that we cannot compromise because of who we are so king we know you have promoted us you've done well we know you will be offended but unfortunately in this matter as we speak we would rather offend man and please God than to offend God and please a man when the sound goes out who do you choose to please when the sound goes out and you're by yourself and, and you think nobody can see you in the realm of the spirit you are exposed astrologers can see you in your bedroom when nobody else can see you pastor may not be in your house but astrologers can see you pastor may not be in your house but there are host of angels in your room pastor may not be in your house but the holy ghost and the heavenly entities bible says since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses you are never alone you are never by yourself so there are no secrets They are watching. Is that king? If it was left to us alone, <laughs> we may just bow our heads and you know we get over it and done with compromise. After all, we've been promoted, we just stay in our place, no problem, king. But they said we know we don't walk alone. People may not be seeing us, but we, we are not alone. Paul is watching Alan. I'm not alone. David is saying, come on boy, you can do it. You messed up, but come on, you can do it. Don't stop, don't give up. Moses is saying, don't stop, come on. I made mistakes too, but you can do it. Abraham is saying, listen, I know it's difficult, 
but you go up to the top because God will not let you down. Elijah is saying, come on boy, this is just a bit of fire. You can go through the fire. Moses saying, listen, it's only a little bit of water. So even though the enemy comes like a flood, God is able to raise a standard. So boy, come on, keep going. You're crying and Jeremiah is saying, my boy, don't you worry. I wept a lot too, but God's faithfulness didn't leave me alone. So my boy, you keep going, you keep going. They are all encouraging us. So King, in as much as we feel like we've got to do this, we can't do it on this occasion, we're sorry. The King was furious. How dare you disrespect me in front of all these people? How dare you choose your God over me? If I put you in the furnace, which God can deliver you? And mind you, the furnace was a, a refinery. What they used to do is when they're about to make their swords and spears, they put them, the metal, into the furnace so that the heat can burn it and get out all the dirt. And then they take it and they forge their, their machines out of it. He said, I'm going to show you where power lies. I'm going to show you where power lies. So he calls all the strong men, some of the strong men in his army, tie them up. Let me show them where power lies. If your God is God, then let him come and deliver you. So they bound them. And then he made a mistake. He said, turn the fire up seven times. When you hear seven, it's not because it was hundred and they go to seven hundred. He said, turn it up till perfection. The kind of fire that can cause havoc. The kind of fire that the furnace may be closed, but we can still feel it outside. Turn it up. I want to show them something which God will be able to deliver them the boys were bound the king's pride was up there the soldiers were were happy and hungry ready to show them even though they got they got promoted above us now look king we told you don't promote these guys and you did so the enemies were laughing at them were ready to throw them into the fire to the point where the men who gathered them by the time they got close to the fire they got burnt but Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were still standing the reason why you are still here even though problems are trying to get you out is because some people died some people gave up some people walked away because they were not ready for the fire but you here you are the fire is destroying the people who were pushing you into the fire but you are still standing you are still here because your situation has not got what it takes to take you out your situation has not got what it takes to take you out. That's why you're still here. So don't you give up on God. The beauty of this scripture is that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they didn't see God standing next to them. Otherwise they would have said to the king, he's right here with us. They had doubts just like you and me. So they said, king, even if he doesn't come ah. Oh, we know he will, but sometimes he will not deliver us. He will allow us to go through the fire. He will allow us to go through the water. So King, even if uh, our God does not come through for us, we still will not bow. So they gathered them and they threw them into, listen, the Bible says they were thrown into the fire and they closed the furnace. But the King was looking in the furnace and people who had been thrown in were standing on their feet people were thrown in they should be lying down but when you look in there they are standing on their feet there is somebody under the sound of my voice finances try to get you down but you're still standing sickness try to get you down but you're still standing your family let you to die but you're still standing people gave up on you but you're still standing everybody turned their backs on you but you're still standing you should have died but you're still standing they thought it was game over for you but you're still standing they messed up everything you have but you're still standing they 
took away your pride, but you're still standing. They took away your honor, but you're still standing. They said it was over for you, but you're still standing. They said you will amount to nothing, but you're still standing. Here I am, standing in the grace of God. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, neighbor, I'm still standing. I'm still standing. Look at the other neighbor, tell them, neighbor, I ain't going nowhere. I'm still standing. I'm not dead yet. I'm still standing. I'm not dead yet. Shout yay! I'm still standing. The three Hebrew boys are still standing because of the decision they took after the sound. It wasn't because of what they were doing before the sound. Because before the sound, they were getting promoted, everything was okay. But after the sound came affliction. After the sound came affliction. Some of you, you were living okay. You were doing fine until you gave your life to Christ. You were doing good until you gave your life to Christ. You had money until you gave your life to Christ. You could dress anyhow until you gave your life to Christ. Then your problem seemed to have begun. Then your problem seemed to have started. But look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, after the sound, I still choose Jesus. After the sound, I still choose holiness. After the sound, I still choose righteousness. After the sound, I still stand for the gospel. After the sound, and here I am, still looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. After the sound, it's when they said, oh king, <laughs> we are not careful to answer you in this matter. After the sound. For some of you, the sound is the promotion of the workplace. For some of you, the sound is the boyfriend that came into your life. You see, you felt you were so strong. You felt you knew Jesus. You felt you loved the Lord. You would give, you would serve. You would do everything for the Lord. Until one guy came into your life and now you have no right. You have no, you have nothing for yourself. You can't think for yourself. Jesus no longer is mighty. Jesus no longer is well. Jesus is no longer your Lord because of the sound of a man. For some of you, the sound was the sound of your qualification. Before you got your masters, before you became a doctor, before you started pursuing your second PhD, Jesus and church was everything for you. But the moment the sound came, now you don't have time for church because you want to read and study. You don't have time for Jesus because you want to be studying so you can pass. The sound of education came and you failed. For some of you, the sound is the sound of your dreams. You were following Jesus patiently. Everything was good. Lord, where you guide me, I will go. Where you lead, I will follow. Until it looked like your dreams were beginning to come to pass. It looked like everything was happening for you. All of a sudden, Holy Ghost, you step aside because the speed at which my dreams are traveling, you can't control this. I've got to be in charge. Holy Ghost, you don't know my dreams. I understand my dreams better. So Holy Ghost, you wait right here while I step on the accelerator because I know the speed I need to move at. I came to announce to somebody the sound of your dreams can cause you to fail. What do you do after the sound? The Bible says they took a stand. Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. They took a stand. <laughs> they took a stand. And by reason of the stand they took, I told you the other day, Jesus gave us a perfect example of who you are. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, neighbor, 
you don't know me yet <laughs> oh tell them neighbor you don't know me yet <laughs> you ain't seen the best of me oh look at your neighbor tell them you ain't seen the best of me tell them this is only the beginning uh, you ain't seen the best of me tell them the best is yet to come the Bible says we are the salt of the earth and I was saying to somebody the other day that the beauty of that scripture or the strength of salt is not in its scarcity because those days when the scripture was written salt was scarce it's not easy to come by salt but now we see salt everywhere Tesco, Asda, everywhere in Sainsbury's you go in my house there's salt everywhere sometimes people even play with salt those days it was not easy to come by but the scarcity of salt did not give salt its value it was in the property of the salt one of the properties of salt is that when you put it over food what does it do it preserves the food but when that same salt which is on the food comes under pressure comes under heat the outer covering of the salt breaks and it brings out the flavor of the food that is why when food is not on fire and you sprinkle salt the flavor doesn't come out but when you put it on the heat it breaks and the flavor begins to come out you see when you go through pressure it is not meant to destroy you it is meant to break the outer cover so the glory of God ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I said when you go through the fire it is not meant to destroy you it is meant to break the outer cover so your true flavor can come out the burning furnace they thought it was to destroy them they thought it was going to finish them but what they didn't realize when the king was saying turn up the fire usually if you want somebody to struggle in fire you turn down the fire so they can roast well like barbecue it will take them a few minutes a few hours before they die if you want somebody to struggle turn the heat down but the king turned it up out of pride because he wanted them to disappear but what he didn't realize is that the Bible says in the book of Exodus, the chapter number one, I believe the verse number 24, he says, and the more they oppressed them, the more they grew and they flourished. Them. So more they turned up the fire. He was just about to crack the outer cover for the flavor of the boys to come. What they didn't realize is that the turning up of the fire was going to reveal something. The Bible says Nebuchadnezzar was in shock. He came, he said, hey, leaders, come here, come here. How many men did we put in the fire? They said, we put three. He said, how is it that I see four? What they didn't realize is that the fire was breaking the outer cover. So the Holy Ghost that was on the inside, the Holy Ghost that was on the inside popped out of them and stood with them. The presence that they couldn't see before was now with them. He said, when you go through the fire, I will be with you. When you go through the water, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you cannot see him, when you cannot feel him, it's because the pressure is something you can handle. But when the pressure goes up, he shows up I said when the pressure goes up he shows up somebody who has been under pressure may the Lord show up in your mind shout yeah I said somebody who has been under intense pressure may the Lord show up in your matter in the name of Jesus I don't know who I'm talking to but he's showing up I don't know who I'm talking to but the fourth man is coming into your situation I don't know who I'm talking to doctors say they can't help you your pressure is much but the fourth man is coming into your situation I don't know who I'm talking to it looks like you've been left for dead but the fourth man is showing am I talking to encounter arena it doesn't sound like encounter arena depression looks like it got you but the fourth man is coming into your matter oppression looks like it got you but depression couldn't do it oppression cannot do it the fourth man is about to show up anxiety got you all worried but here comes the fourth man to enhance your flavor I don't know who I'm talking to receive the word in the name of Jesus Ooh. 
were there not three men that are put in the fire maybe I'm hallucinating but I see four <laughs> and, and if he had said I see only four I would have said yeah maybe the smoke and the heat got into his head a bit but he said I see four and the fourth man looks like a son of the God <laughs> he looks like a son of the gods he has seen a fourth man whom he didn't see before you see when they are maltreating you and mistreating you God is silent not because he's not powerful but he wants them to turn up the heat because he has an agenda connected to what you're going through the miracle God is bringing your way is about to turn the world to him the miracle God is bringing your way is about to cause an unbeliever to believe in him the miracle God is bringing your way is about to shock medicine for medical doctors to look back and say ah this we cannot explain it can only be God Nebuchadnezzar said I see a fourth man and he looks like a son of the gods Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego still could not see him they couldn't see him they couldn't see him but the king could see him what, what, what is the mystery in here when you read the Septuagint, it says when the three boys were thrown into the fire, they began to sing praises. You will not see it in your ordinary translation, but the Septuagint was translated by a group of scholars, all right? They came together and they translated the Hebrew. And they said that these three boys were singing praises. And I remember David said, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So even though they were in the fire and there were three of them, the praises was like an oracle. The praises was like a portal. So the more they were praising him, the fourth man was being developed. So when they were thrown in they saw three but when they began to praise a fourth man began to develop a fourth man began to pull up what I came to announce to somebody is that while you go through what you're going through when you lift your voice and you begin to praise your God when you lift your voice even though you don't feel like it and you begin to praise your God the fourth man is about to show up the fourth man is about to show up tell your neighbor the fourth man is in your praise look at your neighbor tell him the fourth man is in your praise the reason why you can't feel him is because you're not praising you're complaining the reason why you can't feel him is because you're murmuring instead of praising him the Bible says there were two young men one of them was called Paul and the other was called Silas when they were put in prison and they couldn't move when they were put in prison ready to face death they began to praise God and Bible says the presence that showed up in the furnace the same presence showed up and he began to lose their chains when your chains are too tight you need to praise God when your chains are too hard you need to praise God when you don't see a way out you need to praise God because your praise is your escape I said your praise is your escape I feel like I'm preaching this message by myself but I'll preach it anyway I feel like I'm preaching by myself, but I'll preach it anyway. I'll preach it anyway. Uh, were there not three men we threw in the fire? How come there are four? Your praise is a whole entity. A few years ago, I was dealt a really bad blow. The company had overemployed, and one of the people that they had employed was more experienced in the business than myself and so they had to find a way to demote me but they didn't know how to do it so they started plotting and planting and when the contracts come they'll say oh give it to this new guy after all we know your work so your targets are not important so give it to this new guy train him help him 
not knowing the whole time you were passing your contract to somebody else to build. You were building up their own increase and you're building up their own sales levels. So two months later, they're like, oh, your sales levels have dropped. And who is to explain that it is because you were helping somebody and their sales have gone up. How come he's been here two months and he's doing better than you because the same people advised you? The Holy Spirit said to me, don't say nothing. I could have fought, but he said, don't say nothing. So they put me from the sales office. They brought me to the counter sales. So imagine you work in Sainsbury's or you work in Tesco and you are in the offices with the phone making decisions. And all of a sudden they bring you to come and sit at the till. Pew. Hi, Agnes. How are you? Pew, pew, pew. I sat there with a smile on my face. Monday morning, I was at work. And then suddenly this song came to my spirit. I thank God so much for what he's done. So many wonderful blessings and so many open doors. So I was singing, I was just singing it over and over for waking me up this morning. That's why I'm grateful for doing this. That's why I'm grateful. Within the next 20 minutes, my phone began to buzz. So I picked up my phone. I went outside, picked up the phone. It was a young lady called Lisa. She's been to Encounter Arena before when we're in Grace. Lisa said, is this Alan? I said, yes. He said, your CV has just been sent to me. I said, by who? He said, it came from your email address. Bearing in mind, I haven't sent any CVs. He said, and I'm looking at your CV and you can earn twice as much as you're earning now and you can get a job title better than where you are now. I said, tell me about the job. He said, when are you ready for an interview? I said, tomorrow. He said, don't you need to ask the office? I said, I'll phone in sick. Needless to say, in less than a week, I was working as a business development manager in another company, earning twice as much. Your praise can do something that you fighting cannot do. Your praise can deliver something that you pushing your weight cannot do. Your praise can take you somewhere that those people who promise to help you can never take you. What I'm trying to tell you is that situations have the proclivity of letting you begin to feel that I've got to settle, I've got to be quiet, I've got to cry. But he said, how? shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It's not easy. <laughs> but sometimes all you got to do. What a friend we have in Jesus. You may not feel like singing it, but you cry. All our sins and griefs to bear. Then you don't feel like singing, so you cry, you cry. What a privilege to can. What peace we often forfeit. You've got to lift it up because you don't feel like doing it. But oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Then the heavens hear the sound. And then they tap the angels. They tap, they find a bit more. They say, God, there is a situation happening down there. God, there's tears and usually tears come with pain and complaints. But we see some tears that is bringing praises. <laughs> It's coming with praises. It's coming with a praise. And the Bible says, let God arise. And his enemies be scattered. So all of a sudden, you couldn't do it. But one step at a time. Some of you think because the fourth man is in there, you can just run out. No. God keeps you in there for a little while. But the fourth man consoles you and comforts you while you're still in there until the book of Nazar comes in his pride again to declare that nobody should ever lift a voice against your God.
But all this happens because of the step you take when you hear the sound. Church, this morning we heard a sound. As soon as I heard the song, I didn't know, Pastor Joyce listens to a lot of songs. But as soon as I heard the song, the Lord said, this is a sound for Encounter Arena. We, we listen, we will sing it every Sunday until it enters our system. But more importantly, now that we have heard the sound, what stand are you taking? Now that you have heard the sound, would you continue to rebel? Show up when you want to show up? Now that you have heard the sound, will you still choose when to wake up and pray and when not to? Now that you have heard the sound, would you still be pursuing your own dreams rather than the dreams that God has placed upon you? Now that you have heard the sound, would it still be your agenda or the kingdom agenda? Now that you have heard the sound, are you still waiting for Pastor Allen to call you and encourage you before you show up? Now that you have heard the sound, will you still rebel against the Lord? Or would you allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in you? Rise up on your feet, please. Sometimes we think it was easy for Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego just to open up and say, Oh King, we do not care in this matter to answer you no. They said that because they were standing on something. They were standing on our experience.